We have to understand that tenant market, the user experience, because if you can understand user experience, you can deliver a fantastic product. Episode 106. Hello and welcome to the Business of Architecture UK. I'm your host, Ryan Willard, and hooray! Fabulous stuff. This was my first face-to-face interview since March, and what a delight it was to be on site visiting projects of Third Way Architecture, as well as getting the guided tour from founding director Peter Esposito of their offices, which are absolutely fabulous. I really thoroughly enjoyed myself. Um, so. Peter, as I said, is the founding director of Third Way Architecture and they've got quite a unique approach to architecture. They are a traditional architecture practice, but they form part of the Third Way Group, which is a progressive cross-industry family of companies, including design and build, fit out, property contracts, uh, furniture dealership and workplace interior consultants that all work together to deliver collaborative projects that are quite sophisticated in the way that they are aligned to both their clients' business agendas and the needs of the end user. It was also quite brilliant to discover that Peter was also in Unit 14 at the Bartlett, which is the same unit that I was in, although we weren't there, obviously, at the same time. So sit back, relax, and enjoy this brilliant story of how this young architecture practice has grown quite considerably in a very rapid amount of time uh, and how they are competing with industry leaders and how they're really bringing a distinct level of innovation to their approach. So enjoy Peter S. Pazito. So massive thank you to all of you for listening and supporting the Business of Architecture UK for the last couple of years. Big shout out to those of you who have come to our live events, attended the webinars, and of course to those of you who have downloaded the weekly podcast and have been listening to them on your bicycles. And as you know, we love helping architects win meaningful and profitable work, but it's not always that simple to implement these ideas or translate them into something that will work for you. So what I wanted to do was to invite you onto a quick 15 minute chat with myself we can both grab a cup of tea and I'd like to ask you about what content you found most valuable and why and what you'd like to hear more of and I'd also love to hear more about your business and what you're building at the moment and where you are headed to business wise in 2020 so there's no charge or any obligation with this call just simply to find out how our content has been of value and if we get that far and with your permission of course what might be next what might be possible and how Business of Architecture UK could be supportive of that. Does that sound fair? Brilliant. So if you want to book a 15-minute chat with me, I'm calling these calls the BOA UK Discovery Call or just simply a chat with Ryan. Use the link in the information and I look forward to speaking to you. Peter, welcome to um, Business of Architecture UK. Thanks. Absolute pleasure to have you. Likewise, it's good to see the face. Good. Beyond the Instagram stories. <laughs> Excellent. I hope I'm not a disappointment. I hope it's, it's... Oh, no, it's everything I dreamed of. Oh, thank God for that. That's right. I'm always worried. I'm always worried. No, it's brilliant. It's been brilliant this morning. You've shown me around the office. You've yep. shown me around some of the projects that you guys have been working on. Um, and it's a really ambitious and impressive like business that's been built up, you know, what you guys have been doing with Third Way Architecture. So I suppose the first question is just to kind of give us a little bit of an overview of like what your role is, how you would describe your role, and how Third Way Architecture was started and how it fits into the kind of the architecture of Third Way as well. Okay, <clears throat> um, so I'm one of the, the co-founding directors of Third Way Architecture. So me and my business partner, Liam Spencer, um, both run the practice. <clears throat> and we've been running the practice together for the past um, three and a bit years. We met at... <clears throat> We met at a formal practice called Matt Architecture, um, right. and we're doing the normal, you know, thing. We, we, we're pitching on some projects, sat on a couple of others, developing stage three, stage four documents, and doing the rigmarole, <clears throat> living the dream. You know, it was this is what we should be doing. Um, but I was doing one job in Wimbledon for two years, and then we worked together on a, on a second job in Wimbledon for for just shy of a year. But we we weren't doing what we wanted, which was like getting more out there, pitching on more work, and we didn't want to be 40 and being a young um, architect. Um, so we 
set up third way architecture as a sort of a wing of third way group. Mm. Um, and the benefit of this is we're our own company, we're our own p and um, but we have a sort of a mothership that, that owns the majority of our company, um, but means that they can invest in us and we can start to kind of build a practice. So third way architecture exists as a traditional design company. We generate income through traditional means um, and we, we, we work on traditional projects, cut and carve schemes in commercial. We do a couple of uh, residential projects. Um, but the way that we engage the rest of the group is we JV a lot with, with the rest of the company and the company as a, the rest of the group. And the way that the rest of the group is set up is we have Third Interiors, which is a design and build company um, that's been set up, that's been running for about 11 years. It's very much your, your sort of atypical um, D&B company that they do the design and build themselves. Right. Um, after that, we've got uh, Ivy Real Estate, which develop and manage sites. They also uh, buy their own buildings and we worked on a couple of their schemes as well. Uh, we've got Third Way Contracts, which has been, it is a traditional contracting company that only build out buildings, uh, typically cut and carve. We've got Tribe, which are a furniture practice that you know deliver and well, procure and deliver furniture. Um, and we've got Third Way Workplace and we've got other entities that are starting like TX as well. So again, we're a multifaceted a group of companies of which Third Way Architecture is a piece of the puzzle. Right. And so the, the main sort of Third Way company is a, like a holdings company, all these other pieces fit into that, they're owned by that or... Uh, it's, a, it's a holding company, so Third Way Group is the, the majority shareholder of all the other entities right. um, <clears throat> and they, they own interest in, in all the other the, the, the sort of the sister companies within that. <clears throat> um, and so they it means that we can be really flexible to, to clients and it means that we can be supported by them if we have to. Hopefully we're, we're running as a, as, a, as, a, as a profitable business, which we have done from, from day one, or maybe not after the first week, but <laughs> certainly they've invested in us and we've been turning a profitable business ever right. since. Um, but it means that because we have a third way group, we don't have to be so concerned about our bottom line. That's not to say that we don't, um, think about how to generate return it just means that if we want to invest a little bit more or we want to be a bit more speculative or we want to invest a bit more time on a bigger pitch we don't have to kind of look internally about where our income comes from we can go to group and say mm-hmm. look we need investment uh, we don't have to pay a premium on that on that investment as a loan we just need a short-term loan from the group uh, and they can see the quality of our investment because we've been working with them for so long about where we can get a return later down the line. So we can be more aggressive and we can be more speculative. Mm. And we can pitch on, on a diverse, uh, on, a, on a wider portfolio from smaller cut and carve jobs to the latest job that we're on is 280 Bishopsgate. It, it's just really interesting, you know, when we, when we were walking around this morning and, and speaking and the advantages of setting up a practice like this or having this kind of partnership with, uh, with a kind of mothership figure, if you like, has you know you've been able to get involved and execute and play with you know the guys that you're up against or you're bidding against are not small practices you know and you've kind of for for having just sort of started up the business you're doing pretty big scale office work yeah all over major parts of London it, it's it's I always joke with with um, Liam my business partner about. It's, we have no right to kind of be, be the size of practice we are, doing the, the scale and size of jobs that we are in, as, a, as a three-year-old practice. Um, we've got, we employ um, 24 architects and designers. Mm-hmm. We're working on schemes from, you know, 10,000 square foot refurbs to 300,000 square foot uh, repositioning of assets in, in Liverpool to schemes in Glasgow and, and Berlin. Um, and we would never have been able to to reach this ambition if we we just did it as a standalone practice. Yeah. It's just not going to happen. And I think we're not ashamed of that either. We we don't pretend that we've done this just on you know on the skin of our back. We've worked really closely with Third Way Group and, and Ben Gillum, who's the CEO, and the rest of the board to build off the brand that they've been developing using the commodity of Third Way in the best possible way. Third Way is a great brand that really understands the commerciality of, of design, yeah. um, both from a tenant perspective, but also from a landlord perspective. And combining those two insights means that we have a really unique USP on the market. Mm-hmm. Second to that is they had a pre-existing client base. Um, 
for all the landlords, third way with third way interiors were doing a lot of the cate work on a design and build contract. But as they were showing more and more success about <clears throat> making really cool products for cat B tenants to come in and move into, they started inquiring, well, can you do more intricate work? Can you add floors? Can you do an extension? Can you move a core? Can you do wholesale new builds? They could um, and because they knew the limit of their expertise, um, which I think is a mark of good business. Uh, and so they invited uh, me and Liam, having done a JV with Third Way Interiors for the Clockwork Building um, when we were at Matt, um, to start our own practice. Right. And that, from there, we, we, the story, we only had that right, written down in, 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 on paper, but the sort of the anecdote is we had two years to make a business work. And that's not even to turn a profit, but Ben was like, we think there's something in this. We think there's something in having a different approach to architecture that a traditional practice can be profitable working alongside uh, the rest of the group. And, you know, we'll give you sort of two years of sort of, of, of income to make it work. And after two months, we had our first job delivering a 45,000 square foot cut and calf building. So we didn't need two years, we just needed two months. Uh, and then that, that was where we kicked off. Amazing. Do, um, do, in other kinds of architectural practices, do you think that you know architecture businesses are the ones that are often letting the letting the side down? In the sense of you know you've in the context of third way, for example, you've got these other departments that are all kind of well established. Was architecture deemed as a as a risk for the business? I don't think it was deemed as a risk. I think because. Architecture practices are invariably low risk compared to construction companies, design and build companies, because when you go into contracts with with third way contracts, for instance, you're buying you know a single lump sum uh, fixed price, and we have to deliver that price. Mm. If, it, if it's more expensive, then you might be exposed ten grand. You might be exposed a million quid. That's huge risk. If we get appointed on a scheme and you know it. It's delayed by two months and we can't get more fee, we might be exposed by 10, 15 grand. It's relatively low risk. Right. But the exposure to the group is huge because we can start engaging clients on, on, on different, more complex builds, which you know, hopefully we can then invite third way contracts to or third way interiors to bid on the construction side, which can generate um, better profits, a better return on the business, and we can engage the client, you know, with more success. So I think it's relatively low risk on, on that standpoint. And that's why I think the board took the decision to invest in us. Right. And how do you guys go about winning work? Because I mean, you, you were saying to me earlier about there is a lot of, you're actually dealing with the tenants a lot of the time. Actually, you're quite tenant focused. I think um, we're, we're... Which draws you apart from a lot of, like, lot of how many other sort of development companies and design companies are approaching it. I think that is exclusively what we talk about. Right. Um, because a good building is a let building. There's no point having the most beautiful building you've ever designed and no fuckers in it yeah. because you're not generating any return. You're now paying rates on the building. You've got a huge void period. You've exposed yourself to all this construction build. And if it's not fit for purpose, no one's winning. Yeah, we might have got good fee, but we're certainly not going to be used again by the, the, the landlord. Our driver is how can we understand tenant requirements better than anyone else how can we understand the market how can we understand where people are going to move how can we understand the changing nature of tenants and in COVID is a really interesting point because the demands for spaces is going to shift mm. i think it's idiotic to say that no space will be required i just think the shift in requirement will be obvious in in time it's about how can you get steel on the march about under, and understanding what that shift is going to be yeah um, for for Cat B is the the better we can understand the Cat B tenant that will lead so the Cat B leads the Cat A leads the architecture the architecture definitely doesn't come first it's very much low lowest in the pile we have to understand that tenant market the user experience because if you can understand user experience you can deliver a fantastic product and you have that that delight moment that you've talked about with your previous podcast that that comes to fruition and then you can start to really pinpoint the commerciality of that which architects struggle to do mm. how do you identify the economics of good design and, and put a size behind it literally put hard numbers about well we spent x pound per square foot on this building you know say we did a refurb and it was 90 pound a square foot but the void period was x and the rental market was was y maybe you know maybe hit market rates maybe a little bit lower 
but your, your cost was, was not too, too much. I need to go to the client and say, look, I think you should spend £120 per foot, but you're going to minimize that void period and you're going to drive your market rents a lot higher because we've identified you know, the tenants are going to move into that space. And we work really closely with agents on this as well. Again, unashamedly so, to, right. to, 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 to drive the product. The product has to, has to have a commercial return. So um, how do you establish then, what are, the, what are the kind of key metrics that you like to give to the clients to demonstrate this, this understanding of tenants? I think the, the obvious ones are, you know, especially when we're, we're looking at a, a, new, a new building or new site, if either they're going to purchase it or they already do own the asset, is understand what the base case is. So what's the least you have to do to, to reposition the asset? And that is a kind of base case level design, maybe some shifting around the reception. You know, if you remodel the, like the ground floor facade, here's, here's an outline design, here's the cost, here's the program. And then working with the agents and also our third way interiors to understand what we think the tenant demand is going to be on that. Then we go, well, look, we can start to do a lot more work on this piece. We can uplift the spec, uplift the NIA, we can uplift the cost. Here's your program against that, that cost. So you might have, you know, you might be on site in the next two, three months, but we will pick out the tenants that we know are moving in the market at a um, practical completion date. And we can tell you that because we, we work with different systems to kind of give that evidence and we can name them, you know. So that's actually something that you're doing in yeah, line yeah. With, with the agents? That no, and that's, that's identifying that, that those we'll tenants. do that on our side and that's to kind of give support and leverage, but... You know, we're, our job is not agency. Our yeah. job is just to kind of support agency if we can. They get what they get, and we just end up like winning the work, which is, is the most important for us. Mm. Um, and we work, you know, for instance, Collie's uh, City Fringe next door. We, because they're so experienced in design, they they understand the market. We want to bring them on and work with them as closely as we can from from day one, because at the end of the day, they're selling the they're selling the product. So we have to be able to understand what's the best way for them to sell that. And to make sure it appeals not to the lowest common denominator, yeah. but to, to the tenants that are going to drive the, the, the biggest rate. And I think that's so important. And to remove the ego from our side to play to the client's needs. And how do you go about getting that data um, or quantifying, or quanti- quantifying the power of design? Because this is a conversation that comes up again and again and again. Is like, how do architects communicate the value of design? And... Um, you know, it seems that you, what what you guys are doing actually, you've got quite clear metrics and uh, ways, but you and you've got a very good understanding of the client's business agenda as well. Yeah, so I think it's it's a case of bringing the different companies within our third way group together and using what they know. Right. Um, so for us, we can do you know the key risk you know elements around we can grow the NIA by X. We know we need to do you know move some some fundamental infrastructure around a building and here's your planning risk you know we'll work with a friendly planning consultant we'll work with a friendly engineer um, we'll identify all the risk on the build side then we go and speak to third way contracts and say look can you do a one page high level cost and they'll identify all the cost plans here's the rate on the facade here's the rate on the fit out yeah, here are your prelims here's the, the design cost you know and it's always like this is the worst case yeah. so we can always come down from that then we, we might have a, a brief conversation with Ivy. It's like, look, what are the commercial drivers of this building? What the, you know, what's the, 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 what's the value of, of a square foot? So we can have that conversation with the client. So look, we understand it to be X pound per square foot of value. So if you're spending 330 pounds square foot on new build, but your, your exit's going to be 1,200 quid a square foot, it's a no-brainer. Yeah. If it starts to be your exit's only 600 pounds square foot, but your risk is really high, then maybe it's not worth doing. It's not worth spending all that time on that spec work on planning and then to build it out, then to have the void period. We're already in a, in a position where we can start to say, actually, let's reduce the scope because you get a better return at, at the exit point. Then we will speak with third interiors who engage between eight and 900 tenants at any one time, knowing who's going to move in the next three months, six months, nine months, 12, 18, 24 months based on their lease breaks. Um, they'll combine that with just keeping up to date on, on market movements and market drivers to say where they think that the shift's going to, to, to come. Some of it is is a little bit anecdotal. 
Yeah. We, we we obviously temper that in the conversation and say, look, this is this is some of its gut feel, but also these are the rates, these are the movements, these are the lease breaks that are going to happen, and therefore we really expect to see this this shift happening. And in, even to the point of saying, well, we know the building next door is going to get VP, so that's going to sh- you know it's going to maybe sh- it's it's maybe it's going to move the viability of your product or it might help it. I don't, you know, so it's it's understanding those elements, and then it's working closely with the agents to say. What do you think your your market return is going to be? Should we be uplifting the spec because it needs to just be that little bit hotter? You know, we obviously walked around Defoe Court, which is, you know, three minute walk away from Old Street. That spec is very different to 10 minutes up the road to, to Provost Street, which we also walked around. And just getting our head around, which I never did at previous practice, how just three minutes, four minutes walking distance can completely shift the spec of a building. Mm and the market rates of the building and the conversations we're having with clients and about the value of putting two floors on top of Defoe um, and maybe not doing another floor on top of on another so, so, so there's a hell of a lot of kind of um, micro niche knowledge as well that you've got not only about location but about, but about sector and about how the clients are operating and how they're working and the whole third way machine if you like is kind of is well geared towards serving serving that serving those needs i think it comes down to two pieces that the whole group adheres to the first one is total engagement we have to align ourselves with the client's interests yeah. and be honest with the client if we can't um, for the most part because we have a diversity of practices we can find the right outcome they need and that's the second point is the outcome they need and to really identify what are the returns they want because some landlords want to hold on to the asset and just want to get a high lease break. Some just want a quick flip, sell it, get out. You know, if it's a cat B tenant, about what their experience has to be. So having total engagement, we can really build a, a really cohesive brief, one that really understands and unpicks all the nuances within their brief mm. and their drivers because everyone's got a slightly different driver, slightly different risk factors which alter that driver and it's not just one client, they have all the... the the funding behind that will also have different expectations um, through to um, and that that helps us really define the outcome they need because sometimes it's it's not right that it's a design and builds process that actually they just want a, a traditional build and they want to tender it out it tends to be when we have like pension funds involved that it fits the product of what DMB would be excellent at for third way interiors but we know that they need to identify certain items within the delivery so third way architecture comes to the table and vice versa we've had a number of jobs where we could go to a client look great design us we get a design fee out of it uh, we can go through that that process and we can tend around but actually that doesn't fit their their requirements actually or they want a an upfront design they need a fixed price cost and they need someone to take all the risk third way interiors comes in and we can be really flexible um, from the range of business that we have to, to deliver those needs. Okay, so you don't. So if a client is engaging you, they're not necessarily taking the whole turnkey solution. They can they can pick whatever's appropriate for their brief. What's appropriate yeah, for the project? Yeah, like third way architecture, we work with RFM contractors. We're <coughs> working with Gallifrey Tri. Third way contracts are working with Hutt Architects. They're working with uh, Hawkins Brown um, and, um, and and other architects. Third way interiors. Are working with other architects so again we constantly flex to what the client needs right it's not all or nothing because again that's just one that limits our ability to to be flexible to the market um and it means that we can't always give the, the clients the best answer the the reason that we're we have different PLs is that so we can be flexible to the to the needs of of the clients of the market and we can grow and we can shrink as required. Right, so you, you are actually operating autonomously. And, Correct. And then, so how, how do you manage then potential conflicts and overlaps between the, between the different groups? So that's a, that's a really good one. The, the, one of the, I think, the perceived downfalls of having a turnkey solution is that you're not challenging each entity. And it's yeah. so important that that's why we have contracts because you sign up to ERs, you sign up to the CPs of, of, a, um, of a project and that's what you have to, to deliver to. You have a cost plan in there, you have a program. We have requirements on our side, design responsibility matrix that we need to adhere to. 
if we're seen as all batting for the, from the same side, yes, it has huge benefits because we're aligned to meet a similar agenda. You have to create points of conflict. And that's not to like beat each other up and sort of like scream each other and swear each other. But it's about holding each other accountable. And it's right. so important. Uh, and being vulnerable in, in, that, in that circumstance to say, you know, we don't know the answer or we made a mistake or I'm tabling in that. And the way that we develop that, especially with third world architecture and our sister company, third world contracts, is we, we promote that level of, of conflict between the senior team for third world contracts and the senior team for third world architecture to keep the contract honest. You said we deliver this in the ERs. You have not delivered it in the ERs. Deliver it in the ERs. I know it sounds really simple, but if you if the client's going, well, why has it not happened? And we've gone, oh, it's fine, it's fine, it's fine. We're, we're doing no one any favours. We'll mm-hmm. have to rebuild it, or there's going to be change order, or we haven't delivered and there'll be LAD served later down the line. We have to create those, those moments of conflict to make sure there's no scope gap. There's no program creep. There's no sort of... You know, cost creep. It has to. It has to happen. The way that we deal with that is where the benefit of the turnkey comes in. It means that we can manage it internally and go to the client. Look, we had this issue. We've identified the issue. Here's how we're going to resolve the issue. Are you content with that resolution? Move on. Because in a client meeting, we've we've dealt with the issue. We've we've resolved the issue, and they know that actually everything is in control. And whilst that might not be to the palate of all our with all developers, what we start to do with all the projects we completed is it's, it's develop that trust. And we, you're never doing the project wrong. You're always working towards the next one. Yeah. And it's so important to bring the client on the journey with you so they can see and identify how the process works and expose yourself to so the client can really investigate how it's happening, uh, be open and honest about mistakes that have happened and say for the next one, look, we've actually we've improved our... Our, our, our delivery service in this way we brought in a, a senior technical architect on that side or we've got a different design manager from the contract side so they can see that we've improved we can work with them better on the next project and just continue to improve that service how does it work in terms of the majority of the work that you're doing is design and build um, yeah it's all it's all it's all turnkey you know for the most part not everything is we sit client side on a couple of jobs where we're working with different different contractors but for the most part we work either like third contracts will go will, will go under offer on a stage two yeah like fixed price cost on where it's a lower risk uh, product or we'll tender at stage three um they'll do an open book and then we get novated across as well right okay so it's a regular yeah. innovation yeah. and then they become third way contracts become your client effectively correct yeah um, but even that, I mean, obviously the majority that I know of commercial buildings are design and build anyway. Yeah. So Gallifrey Tri um, on a 280, that's a JCT we've innovated across, RFM we've innovated across on Theobald's Road. So that seems to be the, the norm. Um, and I actually think there's lots of benefit in design and build. Um, I know that's not the common uh, narrative from other architects. I think a lot of people are very against it because mm. they think it diminishes the, the involvement of architects. I think... By not engaging design and build, you're actually removing what clients want. They want security. They want a, a risk-free approach to procurement. So we have to find a different approach within that framework. Um, and I think it's about architects actually just doing a better job in the ER stage, in the design stage, rather than saying, oh, contracts only want to make money. Well, okay, let's understand where contracts make a profit. Mm. Let's not be shy about that. Really hold them accountable on the ER stage. Have a really formidable stage three or stage four, you know, set of work that they they price against. Um, then there shouldn't be any cost cutting. There shouldn't be any, um, you know, you know, poor quality deliverables because, like any business, the contractor wants the next job. Yeah. Um, and it's the architect's job in the, in the first case is to protect the design early on. Um, so all this conversation about our DMBs, you know, the curse of the world, actually, it needs to constantly be engaged and tackled and, and, and refined. But there is space for that. There is commerciality uh, for that. And there's a demand for it. Yeah. So we need to keep improving it rather than trying to remove it wholesale. Um, we visited a project earlier where you were showing me that you said that Third Way had about five different touch points on that project. From, from the architecture, the interiors, the contracting, to even being sort of uh, asset holders? So that project was um, Provost Street. That was for a private client. Um, it was for a 12,000 square foot building, which we um, uplifted to, to 16,000 square feet. 
Um, and that was a really nice project where we didn't bend it. We just got invited into that into that process. We did some feasibility work, and as the the project developed, we ended up getting appointed as third way architecture, uh, and we did a scheme up to stage three, where then third way contracts um, were took on the contracting role, and then we innovated across um, IVRE, so IV Real Estate, who are our sort of real estate company and the DM as well they actually got appointed for the DM role and they put their own um, liquidity into the into the building um, to really put our money where our mouth is um, and then as we developed that that building working closely with colleagues City Fringe Group who are the agents and um, with the third of interiors we secured a pre let for the whole building um, for which then third of interiors did the fit out for and then Tribe which are our furniture business did the furniture delivery. So it was fantastic. We Amazing. Had, we had the full suite of third rate group involved delivering a high quality product. Um, and I don't think any of the design quality was diminished. Um, I think you, you saw it. And we're really proud of that as, as, a, as a benchmark scheme to say a turnkey solution done right is, is a brilliant solution to commercial buildings. Mm -hmm. um, we really protected the... The design we really protected the, the procurement route we looked after the client we managed to get a pre-let at a market leading rate um and we we secured you know the the fit out with with the the, the current tenant so again we're unashamed about the success of that project yeah. because i think we engaged we totally engaged the the developer and we totally engaged the tenant and understood their needs and everyone got the outcome they needed perfect and is this something that will be in the future more projects like that where you guys are kind of asset holders as well or was it I think it's a case of the right project um, the IVRE are investing in, in different buildings across uh, London and, and, and active very active in Bristol for instance um, but they're a separate p &L and they also need to get best value we, yeah. third world architecture might not be the best architect you know we actually bid for the job in Bristol um, and we bid very hard for it um, we've also not worked with them on a job because we weren't the right company. So again, it's always about understanding value and walking away or not being appointed for a job. If you're not right for it, we're not doing handouts. Mm. This building, this business has to be run on the best team for the best for the right job. If it if we can f secure an asset where we, the group buys the building, architecture, well, the IVRE DM it, architecture design it, they contract build it, interior do the fit out. Cool, we'll, we'll do it. But at no point are we going to pretend if it's not right that right. we'll have that. And I think that's why Third Rail Architecture set up as its own PL because we can engage where we have to, also recommend other parts of the business where we think they yeah. are better served. What, from, you, from your perspective as Third Rail Architecture, um, when you're bidding for a project, what makes it a viable project? What, what are the ones where you're like, no, this is not going to work for us? <laughs> I don't. I don't think we've. I. <laughs> I don't think we've not gone for a job, and that's only because we don't know what we don't like yet. Yeah. Um, I mean, like we haven't. We don't. We don't do competitions. Um, as, as a as a general rule of thumb, we haven't. Um, that's that's not where we are offering best service. We think we can get more leverage out working with a client um, to help them buy a building. Or if they have an asset, we think we can really expose the value add on, on, a, on a job. Right. But we've done a pop-up for Landsec um, and Sustainable Ventures on the South Bank to, you know, like a, a to 280 Bishopsgate, which is a 300,000 square foot refurb, to we're doing new build residential. We've, we're working on a synagogue. You know, and we haven't bid necessarily for those. These have mostly been kind of invited projects. Um, and we're just having a kind of, I dare say, fun. It seems like too much of a cheat word. I feel like it needs to be more reverential. But it's a bit of a laugh. <laughs> no, no. Yeah. Um, well, no, I mean, I mean, you were showing me earlier some of the pitching documents that yeah. are involved with some of the clients. And my first response was like, you guys are having fun doing this. I think, I think it, it comes down to the, the and this is, comes from group level, is that we're not satisfied with what we've just done. Yeah. And we have no requirement to adhere to like, like brand standards. Like we do have a brand and we do have brand standards. But it's like, how can we, how can we pitch harder next time? How can mm. we try a different way of approaching and engaging the client? You know, especially the, the creative team in, in Third Way Interiors are mad good. And they do not hold back, you know, from branding shirts to creating a little pinball machine in a pitch dock 
to setting up you know, pop-up meeting rooms in an empty Cat A Plus to show them that we can deliver and we can you know, host spaces at the turn of a button. We only had two days to turn that around. And they just don't hold back. It's, it's, it's very much taking like advertising culture in terms of you know, what's not possible and kind of really pushing the boundaries every time and not resting on our laurels. If we, if we didn't win, Mm. It's not to go back to what we know and safe. It's actually to try hard and go bigger next time. Yeah, you know, we'll make big models. We'll do all the visuals. We'll 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 have pitch documents with kind of with different um, uh, media to kind of test that experience and uh, and have fun with it. Yeah, really explore and, and test that experience because it has to come down to experience. Yeah, and we have we always focus on the user experience in our buildings from a cat A perspective, from a cat B perspective. And that's no difference to the experience of how we pitch. It has to be positive, it has to be really engaged, and it has to kind of tell, you know, interesting stories. Mm. How have you been nurturing the culture of third way architecture, the team specifically? I think the, the it's, cult- a, it's, a, it's a young team, right? It's a really young team. And I don't know I don't know where it sits within the rest of um, the rest of architecture, but the the culture is it's yes we have a micro culture within third way architecture but it's very much born out of the group culture yeah and I think culture for third way is the all encompassing piece you know mm. that drives everything um, and that enables them to to run a profitable business so you know from small things obviously not so much in in COVID but um, you know every Thursday we have a team presentation at you know from four which is kind of fueled with a, with a couple of beers and, and, and wines and it's not about company updates but it's about stories that have happened you know awkward ones funny ones a bit of a joke and a bit of a laugh and it kind of it always brings everyone together and because there's different departments it's very grounding it's kind of very liberating, li- liberating and it's, it's it's a good crack we always have lunch together on Wednesday with a full team um, we always take people away once a year on a sort of a summer trip and you know we have a very relaxed atmosphere here there's no sort of it's it's not hot desking it's just kind of work wherever it kind of suits you it's be very easy going if you want to go down the pub you can go down the pub um as long as you've done your work and i think that's what it comes down to it's just it's giving autonomy with that responsibility yeah and so the company culture of having all the sort of the perks of the job feed into the perks of the job of like the professional side in architecture one of the reasons that we wanted to start our own thing is we didn't want to hang around. We did want to pitch. We did want to be exposed to clients. We did want to walk the course across rooftops across London, which is one of the coolest things about this thing. We did want to want to have that kind of exposure to the playfulness and the, and the excitement, the energy of architecture, which you don't get when you're working on one job for two years. Yeah. But comes with that is the responsibility. Fine, you want to join this practice. Here's the autonomy to, to engage clients, pitch to clients. Your design as well, pitch to clients, because that's the autonomy we give you. But comes a responsibility. You have to turn up. You've got to deliver that pitch. It has to be exceptional. It has to be driving mm. nuances that maybe people haven't seen before. And it has to hold up commercially. You have to be able to deliver that through through the presentation. And and if it doesn't hold up, we're not going to you don't know about chewing people out or making people feel bad, but it's really understanding those 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 elements where we came up short, celebrating them in the right way to say that if we have pitched hard, we have given it our all, we have done everything that could have been asked of us to to give the client the best experience and the best reason to choose us, and we still haven't won. Well, that's fine. That's okay. Well, let's let's go harder, and it's picking our pens up again the mm. next day and, and going harder. Um, and also when people have made mistakes, it's about supporting those individuals to say, yeah, it was a mistake. And yeah, you should have caught that. And yeah, maybe we didn't handle that in the right way. But how do we coach and support people to, to go again? So they learn from the experience. And we have, you know, I'm 32, Liam's 31. We're, you know, we, we're young owners of, a, of a, an architecture practice. Our associates are I think, 35, 34 and 30. The rest of the team are younger, apart from our, our technical director. Um, we're, we're a young but very hungry practice. We're not. We haven't been exposed to the same amount of jobs that you know, DMFK or an HMM or a BGY have. But that's okay because we've got the hunger and they have the know-how. So if they don't know the answer, they certainly know how to go and get the answer. Mm. And it's because we've given the autonomy to go and own the issues and to report back what the issues are, but also to report back how to resolve those issues. And that's where we hold sort of the team accountable in that, in that sense. Brilliant. 
What do your competitors think of you? <laughs> um, are I'm, they nervous? I, I don't. I, I, are they, they? They they would probably say they're not nervous because they don't. I, I imagine they don't think a lot of us. Um, and I think it, there's an interesting. I think there's different tiering. So I would say that uh, you interviewed um, Dicky Lewis from from Red and White. After, yeah. Oh, yeah, that's white, red, and white, white, red, Actually, white, red, right, white, white, red. Sorry, Dicky. Um, they're 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 kind of our age and they're doing sort of similar projects and I think they respect what we do even though it's different and I have all the time in the world for, for how they've like they've grown their practice very traditionally um, in terms of how they've built out their clientele yeah and, and you know when we you know, we kind of share stories and that's been really positive I think the the more established practices don't get it and I think design and build has got a really bad reputation. Mm. Um, in terms of, you know, it's all about cost, nothing on design. And if third-way architects are associated with the design and build model, um, they kind of tar us all with the same brush. I don't even think third-way is a typical design and build company. The the, the designs that third-way interiors are doing are formidable. I think they're stronger than a lot of traditional companies. They, they can go toe-to-toe against Gensler, against um, HLW, against uh, M. Moser because of the quality of designers they, they attract into this model. Um, so we've pitched against the likes of BGY. Well, we lost against BGY. We lost against DMFK. We lost against Warren Partners. We've lost against Gensler. We've lost against PSE Co. We've also won against PSE Co. We've won against BGY. We've won against Warren Partners. We've, we're doing a JV with Maury Smith. We've, we've won against Stephen Drillian. And that's not because... Um, we're, we're selling something cheaper. It's we're taking a different approach to what the client needs. Those are all formidable practices, yeah. and I have, and you know, we, we reference them all the time. Our, our documents are filled with precedents about you know schemes that they've done because they're wicked. I mean, anything to to, to have schemes like Piercing Co just finished a building around the corner. It's it's one of the best builders I've been to in London for a long time. It's like a museum, and it is. So I don't. It's not just about. I, I see it as a as a as an accolade to, to, to be pitching against these these formidable practices, and uh, I got sent a I got sent a pitch doc um, for a scheme that BGY had been on. They referenced one of our jobs. Oh, I was like, oh, this is I'm well happy with that. That is it's happened finally because we lose them all the time. And I think um, I I think for us it's about not getting carried away with just trying to to beat other practices because then you start to lose what it is we do mm. and you know we're not it's not called Liam and Pete's architecture practice it's, it's third world architecture we remove the ego from from the conversation how do we test ideas explore ideas in a way that again comes down to that total engagement piece we don't have a set style but we have a really good process and I think that affords us to be more flexible maybe than our competitors mm. I don't I can't say that's 100% true but I think we can be really dynamic about how we approach different archetypes and different problems within our buildings that delivers commercial returns, which means that the client gets what they want, we get what we want from the design side, and we get to go again. Um, so coming back to the point about do other architecture practices feel nervous? No, but I wonder if they're looking at how they can repeat what we're doing yeah. and about engaging with, with, with other JV partners on, on our contracting side or thinking about how we leverage our position with tenants to, to, to deliver the same answers. Well, what other influence do you do you have as an architect practice from, say, the other board members of Third Way? So I mean, you, you were saying that there's a, there's a mixture of people who are not architects, mm. which is actually... It's perfect. Which is brilliant. Yeah. Um, we have a really... We have a... Um, and how does that relationship and how does that information kind of get disseminated into what you guys do? We have a really... Um, I think me and Liam are incredibly privileged about the board that we that we that we work with, mm. and it's and I say work with over report to because it's very much working with. Yeah. They support us, they engage us, they push us. It's not just about setting targets, but it's about setting agendas and then helping us to meet those agendas to go on that journey with us. And it's not that straight line. It's you know it's the peaks and troughs of that process is is hugely challenging, and especially as me and Liam have not run a practice before at three years old it's, it's a huge learning curve mm. so on the board you know we've got Ben Gillum who's the CEO of, of Third Way Group he's got a law background and not a design background and 
he's you know he's entrepreneurial the way that he set up these different business businesses to to, to deliver different assets within real estate is is really interesting he's constantly testing new proposals to go forward um, then we've got Liam Copeland who um, he's got an MBA from LSC he also one of the co-owners of Ivy Real Estate so he has kind of two hats on but he kind of works with us um, on a day-to-day basis about uh, the operations and the financing of, of the company and giving us totally removing himself from the architecture side and being very focused on the business about helping us making key decisions without you know getting too emotional about the thing mm. about removing that and that's been a hugely kind of valuable for me uh, from the from where I kind of get caught up in the, the sentiment oh, I feel bad about that and I know is it going to move the dial of 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 acknowledgement, you know, what's going to be the long term effect of this decision, you know, or why are we spending twenty minutes on this decision when it, it's it's pointless because it's it's not going to have a financial impact or, or it's not going to have an impact on the, on the long term future of the business. Let's make a decision and move on because it's wasting everyone's time. And then we've got um, uh, two guys um, on the finance side, or Michael Sullivan who who runs the finance team. He's thirty three. He's uh, he's a, a He's a genius is the best way to describe him. <laughs> um, he's, he's, you would never, he never lets on about the amount of knowledge he kind of carries in the head from the finance. He does the finance for the whole of the, of the group. He's a formidable character. And the last one is Jonathan Sweeney, who's also on, on the ops team. And again, ex, also um, ex-Capco. So again, this group of individuals that all work as a, as a cohesive team the support and push and engage me and Liam to run a better business mm. and make key business decisions. So everything from doing the, the kind of the mundane of, you know, if we're approaching a, a project from a, a typified fee model basis, about how do we write fee models, quite dry, to, all right, how do we flip this? How do we engage a, a, a developer in a different way? How can we, you know, apply fees in a different way? How can we, you know, say we're going to, you know, put it into a holdings company? How can we approach the way that we set up a business to to be more flexible or more engaging or more opportunistic? And we're constantly testing those uh, those pieces. And again, we're everyone's learning. I shared the the Joe Cohen podcast with 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 the team, and we've we listen to it, and we're constantly we're not going to pretend that we're the best in the business. Mm. We are acknowledging that we think we're going to try harder than anyone else. Yeah. And I think it's having that mentality of like one of the lines here is like, drive it like you stole it. It's, it's constantly going at it and constantly testing, you know, <laughs> possibility. And that's from an architecture side to a finance side to, you know, all the different businesses that we have under a third way group. It's brilliant. I, I, I highly, I just think it's such an intelligent way of of entering into running your own practice like you've got the best of both worlds yeah and you're leveraging this experience and you know the consultative capacity of this of a you know a group of people and leveraging their talents as well which means that you can you know a you become a very you've become very focused on what it is that you're the proposition that you're offering to the marketplace you understand your market yeah very deeply you're not going through this kind of scramble phase of sort of trying one sector and going into another sector and doing all this sort of stuff. It's very kind of compact and has been, you know, you can see it from the type of work that you're doing in such a short period of time. Yeah, I think the um, what's been really interesting for us was we set out to do commercial office space, yeah. commercial office buildings. And as of probably last year, 90% of our work was commercial office, apart from a little bit of resi. Um, because we're very good at it. We know how to do cut and carve buildings. We know how to reposition assets. We talk about them as products. We've now got an, enough schemes under our belt to, to, to validate what we said in the first run. But because we talk about them in products and we, because we talk about the user experience as that quintessential driver to any decision we make, how does it make someone feel coming to that space? Buildings aren't let by the CEO anymore. They're let by the HR manager, or the, the studio manager. Because they they want to know how their team's going to behave and engage in that space, and we take that learning experience and how we approach buildings into now the residential market, mm. which we haven't even bid on. We just got invited in because they saw what we were doing in, in office space, and they're like, "Well, can you apply that same process into resi?" We can't come up with them with the same. We don't contracts don't build resi. Third interiors don't fit out or have tenant knowledge of resi. 
but our process still behaves in the same manner. Understand the user experience, you're going to get more interest, it's going to, you know, it's going to rent or it's going to sell quicker, um, and it's going to, you're going to drive a better experience and a, and a better commerciality of the buildings. So we started off with um, eight uh, flats in some townhouses on, on Theobald's Road, and that level of residential has grown into um, high-end flats in Bucksmead to 40 new build units to Reading to working on a huge um, uh, 300,000 square foot development in Glasgow um, and, and everything in between on Resi, which is not following the USP that we started off with, yeah. but following a process that we've developed and honed yeah. uh, that we can we can share with our clients. Um, and that's been, that's been huge for us, especially in the market now where Resi is holding up a lot better than the commercial. To have that diversity in our, in our portfolio is it's really important. Two words that you've used quite a lot today, um, product and journey. Yeah. What do they mean to you? Um, on and, why, and, why are they, and why are they important? I think products are really important because we're not talking about architecture. We are talking about products. And it's not about us trying to win awards in the RBA or... Yeah, it's great that we're getting featured in the Architects Journal, and that's great to for peer recognition. But architects aren't appointing us. Um, we don't make any money from other architects. Um, we need to be in like the Evening Standard or the Financial Times or, or you know, Property Week, you know, magazines and articles that developers or clients read rather than what we think we should be mm. read in. And therefore, instead of changing, instead of talking in the same terms as architects would that we're doing in architecture, you know, it's a lovely cornice or look at that beautiful ornamental steelwork or you know, the material palette's been gorgeous. Ah, no, it's talking the same language. Let's understand the commercial drivers. And at the end of the day, we're selling a product. You know, these, these buildings get branded, they get marketed, they get sold as packages, they get put in different um, portfolios. They are products. And so as soon as you can understand them as products and start to talk them into them as products, the products have context, of course, you know, and they have all these bits about architects that, that move into it. But if we can talk to them, talk to clients about the products of which we're working on, we can improve the product and we can make sure that we're, we're understanding what that, that thing has to, has yeah. to do. Um, the second piece was the journey. I think the, the journey is being... Uh, has been a really good one. And I think that's to help me and Liam decide about some of the decisions we've made. And it's not always, it's not always been, it's not always helped us make the right decisions, but it's sometimes helped us justify why we made those decisions. So we we worked on a, on a business park in, in Dublin and we had a big old chat and I still bring it up that Liam didn't want to do it because it was a business park in, in Dublin. And we're like, you know, we're a six month old practice. We don't want to be wasting our time. That's not where we think our bread and butter is. I was like, oh, you know, go to Dublin. <laughs> like, I don't want, I just want to go and have a, I want to go and enjoy the journey, the journey and the experience of doing it. We did a business park in Dublin now. So that's kind of part of our portfolio. And it was, it was really interesting doing it. To we've picked up three jobs in Germany now. And again, does that fit our USP? Does that fit our quintessential business plan? Maybe not. Actually, you know, push comes to shove, we probably didn't make a great deal of money on, on those jobs. But the experience and the journey was what makes it worth, mm. completely worthwhile. Because whilst the, I kind of wonder what, you know, the sentiment of the business of architecture, are we talking about an end goal? I hope not. Because the end goal is being 70 with maybe some accolades and awards, but being very tired, very haggard, and you haven't had a good or great time getting there. It has to be that the journey was far more, far more beneficial than the end point. If I've got a, a huge amount of buildings, maybe, you know, the, the, maybe they haven't award, won any awards or they didn't get published, but the experience was wicked, that, that's got to be the driver. It has to be the driver. And I think taking that same, same, same belief that, that, that I hold with Liam about, experience has to kind of be everything yeah you just put that into the same same manifesto you have with buildings the journey that someone has in that 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 product has to be has to be delightful has to be better than other 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 architectures or other office fit outs that we do because that delight you can't it, it's great that you almost can't quantify it to the to the nth degree and um, because then it's easy to kind of repeat that that delight has to come from 
the the excellence of the people that we work with, with the architects and designers that, that work in third-way architecture. And again, it comes down to the, the original point about autonomy versus responsibility. We're given the autonomy to create delight and taking responsibility for, for owning that. And that comes to the full circle about how Brilliant. we approach buildings and how we get the designers to work on them. So what's... You, you know, obviously, we are kind of um, been dealing with this pesky virus that's yeah. happened over the last few months, and this is obviously going to have a, ma- a massive impact on, on, the, on the office sector. How? What's the future, do you see, of, of that sector, and how are you guys responding to it? I think, I, I think it's good to say that um, no one knows, yeah, um, and not pretend that there's there was so much white noise as soon as i mean when lockdown was really in its you know in sort of week three or week four i mean how many articles did you read that was the death of you know, the death of the office you know real estate's dead the city's dead ah oh, you know it's all a disaster and i keep coming back to people like people people love being around people they love engaging they love talking they love um being in the company of others zoom don't cut it for a second i can't tolerate zoom anymore because you have to kind of speak a little bit louder and sort of dry to make sure your voice comes through and there's a glitch with the, the presentation and you're talking to like a maybe a name and you can't have those serendipitous moments you can't pop out for a drink you can't do what we're doing now and have a little walk around site so i think the first bit is to say there's definitely a future for 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 commercial real estate i mm. think I, would, I i think that's unequivocally true what that's going to be is sort of the next piece. So I think for me, I'm breaking down to two parts. The first was when cellular office spaces went to open plan, um, they became a lot more efficient. The real estate didn't drop. You know, we just became more efficient and we started creating more amenity spaces, more breakout spaces, more more things for people to do in the office space. So the experience changed. It was no longer completely desk-based but it was about work-based. You know, how can we offer a variety of services within the office space for people just to be able to do their work? My feeling at the moment is that the shift is going to be about how can people live in the office environment and taking a lot of things that people enjoy in the home experience to the the office experience and no longer really calling the office because I think the office kind of takes ideas of um, like, the office with Ricky Gervais and Slack, you know, it's that kind of like, it's very beige, it's very kind of mundane. Yeah, you have a couple of meetings and a tea point. But, you know, working with some of our bigger cat tenants, it's about what are the home experiences that are so, that have been so enjoyable in lockdown that people would benefit from having in, in, a, in a work environment. And that's not to make people be at work all the time because it's not to say that I'm promoting just this insane amount of like stressful hours about being in the home envi- being in the work environment. But it's about if you can find opportunities for people to enjoy what they do because work isn't just about crunching numbers or doing something. I'm I'm in a fortunate position to I really love and enjoy what I do and I love being in the office environment. Um, and so I think it's about. You know, it does it become more like lounge spaces and, and breakout spaces, which is more very much about having that homely kind of vibe to it. There was already a shift into like the hotel sector and designers coming into the commercial office because that's what the, the space they wanted. It's about having more variety of different like, you know, pitch spaces to, to cinema spaces to, you know, it could, you could start getting silly with like skate parks or you could have florists in the space. Or I don't know I don't know what, but it's really taking those those elements of mm the wider city or those wider like amenity spaces which become really uh, really desirable into that commercial space because again people want to be around people yeah uh, and you get to, to think and, and address ideas in a much more dynamic way when it's you can read body language and you can look at the person in the eyes we're doing now and, and try and explore ideas rather than it being oh we've got a presentation at one o'clock for 45 minutes on the free zoom service and it has to be very forced and then you can't talk over someone because it's it's um the you know the interruption is a slight lag and, and delay and it's it's very forced and it comes back to that thing that oh it was really efficient working from home when we started working from home but i think that was the, the trajectory of 
everyone knew what they were doing in the office and now they had they were very focused they had no more interruptions great i'm gonna i'm gonna work from home now and deliver so everyone delivered all their deliverables on time oh we're super efficient great i'm gonna cut my overheads no more business no more, no more commercial real estate you try and onboard someone you try and start a new project you try and deliver nuance and nuance mm. is so important to being a better job it's it's a nightmare that, that's, that's such a good point is it's the you know, it's the richness and the nuance of, of people and of, of projects that comes through the sort of personal interaction. I think you're quite right. There's no, you know, I mean, it's just my own personal experience of being able to, you're like, you know, this is the first interview I've done in person since March. And it's yeah. like, it's such a richer experience. And that's on a sort of, on a micro level, you know, this is what's happening in all sorts of businesses, that the experience between people is... And I, I it, that, 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 piece about the, the person and the emotive piece in this because again the drivers come down to overheads or cost of rent and all these how do you put a value on um that that, that experience that uh, so for some people being working from home is the ideal and i'm not going to pretend that that's not true for, for some that's great and if you can have that flexibility and that choice absolutely you should be able to inha- inha- yeah. inhabit that choice and deliver what you want to deliver but when you're working in, a, in an isolated space, that sense of loss, and I think I felt that, certainly, which was, I don't know how to express myself. I'm, I'm, I'm much easier at kind of having open dialogue, not particularly knowing what I say when I say it, but it's it sort of the ideas develop as, as I'm communicating. Yeah, yeah. And then having the comfort with someone to explore those ideas. So it becomes much more free thinking that I can nip into a conversation for five minutes after you because I just need to test a thought. I'm not going to call someone and say, oh, you just need to test a thought and you know, hang up. It's, it's kind of, or someone capturing you when you feel m- m- most vulnerable. You're having a really difficult day. And it's not to kind of modicoddle people, but it's actually in, in environments like this where you know, the pace of work today is, is much faster and people could argue that work from home would be slower, but... I don't think that's the market. It's important that people can see you, can capture you, can address you, support you, push you. Mm. You can't do that over Zoom. You can't do that from working from home. And and the delight of being in a in a studio environment, there's a there's a there's a quality which I think in, would be hugely missed if we just went down to this kind of isolation working from home home piece. That's not to say where you know three days on, two days off, and, and that balance. I think again could could really help because also it's good to take yourself out of these yeah. intensive environments. Yeah, yeah. But I just think that that level of of being vulnerable with others is the best way you can get to something more exciting. Mm. Because if everyone's coming in strong minded and I'm independent and I'm presenting this fantastic, very edited, very controlled presentation, there's no ability for. That's, that was a really lovely way of putting it. Is that is that the actually being with people allows the vulnerability of each other to kind of be there yeah and actually actually it's a very powerful and it, it, again it, being able to say being and for me and Liam as well just kind of to say to to, to, to our team in, in third world architecture and I'm sure this is true of the the other uh, managing directors and, and the rest of the team that exposing yourself to what you don't know allows the rest of the team to step up and again you know more and more you see like on LinkedIn or or even on TikTok about these entrepreneurs about, you know, you have to know what you're doing. And, you know, I'm very confident and sort of very like obvious masculinity coming into like managing a business. I was like, well, I don't relate to that. Mm. Like, where's, where's the space for me to help you? Where's the space for me to support in that environment? Where's the space for us to, for us to, to test? Well, no, because I, I know all the answers. Da, da, da. If you can leverage a, a piece of vulnerability, say, look, I'm very good at this, but I'm weaker here. And I'm telling you, I'm weaker here, and I need you to come and, and support and lead on that in that in that, in that piece. And we're very explicit when we when we engage our you know, people that join us is to say, I'm not hiring you to kind of fill a role. I'm, I'm, we're hiring you and to work with us to, to lead a, a new uh, ability that we can see in your portfolio that your your concept work is is epic or the way that you do Revit and, and manage pieces is much stronger. We want to kind of head that piece. We want you to be challenging us as a business to do better because we've shown you that we're vulnerable. We've shown you that we have weaknesses in our business. Yeah. Come and make us better. Uh, I'm unshy about um, sharing that. Great.
Brilliant. I think that's a perfect place to conclude the conversation. Peter, great. thank you so much. That's thank been... you so much. No, it's been great. Thank you. And that's a wrap. Thank you so much for listening. And don't forget to book your 15-minute chat with me by using the link in the information. I look forward to speaking with you. The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract bond or commitment except to help you be unstoppable.